This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. I want now to talk more about uh, the state of uh, our current uh, econ economy, uh, but to do it against the background of uh, this relationship, which uh, I think is important of uh, value transfers that occur uh, under a free market uh, e economy uh, and through the equalization of the rate of profit. Now, the argument I've been making then is that the equalization of the rate of profit is the problem, uh, not the market. Uh, that when uh, Hayek and Friedman and all the rest of it talked about uh, the perfection of the market and uh, lauded it, uh, Marx actually goes along with it and kind of says, you know, the market is a radical leveler, leveler and a cynic. It uh, actually contains within it possibilities of equality and all the rest of it. So that Marx is not opposed to the market per se. Marx is not opposed uh, to uh, free trade through the market. What he is opposed to is the equalization of the rate of profit. Because through the equalization of the rate of profit, we start to see uh, the accumulation of wealth uh, within certain metropolitan regions and certain centers of the global economy, and an, an accumulation of wealth that promotes an even greater accumulation of wealth over time. And therefore, what we get is a greater, greater levels of uh, inequality uh, through uh, this equalization of the rate of profit. Now, the equalization of the rate of uh, profit has the effects it does because of this contrast uh, between capital intensity and labor intensity. And that contrast, it seems to me, is something that needs to be uh, brought under control. And the way that it can be brought under control is by, by having the free movement of technological capacities and powers. Now, it is, I think, very interesting historically to see how the United States looked at uh, the transfer of technological understandings and technological skills from one part of the world to another uh, from the 1950s onwards. And from the 1950s onwards, the United States was terribly, terribly concerned uh, about China and the threat that Chinese communism and Soviet communism was going to pose uh, to the U.S. domination in the world. So one of the things that the, the U.S. set up was a policy of containment. And that policy of containment was about trying to support the revitalization of the Japanese economy, trying to support the South Korean economy, the Taiwanese economy, Hong Kong and Singapore, because then what you would have is a circle, uh, an arc of rich nations which were surrounding China. Now, the interesting thing during this period was the, the, the United States did not put up any barrier to technology transfer to those countries. In fact, technology transfer was pretty open. Uh, and and therefore Japan could uh, take technologies from the United States, could develop those technologies in its own way, uh, so that we started to get the technological uh, wizardry of the of the Japanese. Uh, the same thing happened to the South Koreans. Same thing happened to Taiwan. Is the United States was effectively s uh, allowing those countries free access to technological information. And that free access, of course, allowed those countries to develop. So if you look at all of the countries and, and ask yourself the question, why was it that those Asian countries uh, became, went from sort of low income uh, to middle income to upper middle income countries uh, over this 40 years period? Well, it had a lot to do uh, with the way in which the United States did not try to prevent uh, any kind of technology uh, any technology transfer. Now, along come the Chinese, and they're looking at the development trajectory of uh, Japan and Singapore and all the rest of it, and they start off with labor-intensive uh, forms of industrialization. 
uh, huge labor force which was, could be mobilized and was mobilized. And of course, within 20 years, uh, China became in effect the workshop of the world, producing a vast array of goods, goods uh, which were uh, largely created through labor intensive forms of uh, production. But uh, a number of things have happened uh, since then. The crisis of 2007-2008 uh, undermined uh, the export of those goods to many parts of the world, and therefore China had to start to think about uh, making something different. It had to think about developing its own internal market uh, and, 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 and the like. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the effect of the one-child policy in China, which uh, had been rigorously enforced from the 1960s onwards, uh, that one-child uh, policy uh, meant that the, the surpluses of labor, which had been there in the 1980s and 1990s, were drying up, and you're beginning to get an aging population. And uh, so you suddenly find that the labor surpluses, which had been the foundation of labor-intensive industrialization, are no longer there. Wages in China started to rise up. Uh, a lot of uh, political unrest in working people in China. And, and of course, the, you have the Tiananmen Square episode and the like. And the Chinese, I think, understood that if they were going to maintain power, uh, they had to actually try to buy off the support of large segments of the population by developing an internal form of consumerism and develop uh, an alternative uh, economic uh, base. And so they wanted to make the same transition that Japan had made earlier and South Korea made, that is to move from labor-intensive forms of production to capital-intensive forms of production through uh, technology. Now, this is where the United States came in and started to complain bitterly about the way in which China had appropriated uh, technological skills and technological ideas um, uh, and, 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 that and, and that therefore uh, some, that, that, that technology transfer had to, had to stop which, of course, is radically different from what I already indicated was the policy towards Japan and Taiwan and all the rest of it. So China now has uh, one of the super, superior forms of artificial intelligence. Uh, it has built uh, companies uh, over a 10-year period like uh, Huawei, for example, which was had hardly any standing uh, before 2010, but has uh, surged as being one of the most sophisticated uh, uh, telecommunications with 5G technology and all the rest of it. So the United States is block, trying to block Huawei, is trying to prevent China moving uh, to this uh, capital-intensive uh, uh, construction. My own view of this is that I don't think the United States has a chance in hell of actually stopping the Chinese doing this. On the other hand, what it can do uh, is to start to utilize its powers uh, to try to, to throw monkey wrenches into, in, in, into what the Chinese are doing. And this creates, I think, uh, a lot of potential friction and uh, potential dangers, it seems to me, in terms of geopolitical rivalry and how, how China is... Uh, uh, beginning to uh, operate in the rest of the world. Meanwhile, China has surpluses of capital and is starting to export those surpluses of capital. So if you look at a, at a, uh, at a map of uh, Chinese capital exports, it goes from almost nothing to uh, a huge amount of movement of capital out, particularly into Africa, uh, uh, but also uh, into other areas. I mean, one of the things the Chinese did was to start to acquire technology companies in northern, uh, in North America, technology companies in Europe, and use uh, the acquisition of those te technology companies to transfer uh, uh, intellectual property rights uh, to China. And of course, China had these rules about foreign investors when they came in. They, they could only come in if they partnered with the Chinese company and shared technology. So there's no question that China has been appropriating technological expertise from the West at the same time as it's been developing its own capacities to develop its own technological expertise. And I think that actually right now, 
China's own capacities in this uh, uh, in this area are uh, dominant, uh, and uh, the the kind of the the phase of technology technology transfer is uh, uh, is large is largely over. So uh, this is the 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 the, the situation uh, in which we find ourselves in a kind of uh, very interesting economic uh, situation. In which, if all economies start to become technology uh, rich, if there is a flattening out of the technological world, then the the the, the continued transfer of value from labor-intensive economies to capital-intensive economies is going to be undermined, and that will be particularly the case if uh, there is a revival of capital controls. And it is interesting that the one country that survived the crisis earlier of 1997-98 in East and Southeast Asia was Malaysia. And Malaysia survived it by introducing capital controls, which everybody said would never work, but they did work. And the one country that has not opened up to uh, free capital flow is, of course, China. So China has actually resisted the equalization of the rate of profit. And in fact, within China, the profit rate doesn't really matter so much as the mass matters. That because you're working with state-owned companies and because the state-owned enterprises uh, have a, a different structure to them, and, and, and are less concerned with profitability because they can always be propped up by the state-owned banks, we now find uh, that that uh, the Chinese situation uh, is is very is very different uh, from the rest of the world. That they have still a level of protection of their own economy, which doesn't exist elsewhere. Because although China has signed onto the WTO, it was given a grace period in which to to adjust. And it's managed to sort of play around by saying, well, we've opened up, but now we haven't opened up. So there's a, 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 a lot of this going on. So here we have a situation in which the United States geopolitically is trying to prevent China from moving towards technological uh, and, and capital-intensive modes of, 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 of production. And... In, in so doing, it is invoking uh, intellectual property rights as being one of the big issues that is absolutely critical to the World Trade Organization structure. Now, what this says is intellectual property rights is actually enclosing the global commons and turning something which should be open to all, that is knowledge and, and understanding, into uh, a form of property, which then you need a license uh, to utilize. Now, in the past, it's interesting. You see, capital has never survived very well on intellectual property rights. Some of the richest times of innovation under capitalists have been at times when patent laws were not really very significant or important. People went ahead and innovated and did what they did. And yes, indeed, uh, those who did the innovations very frequently got no benefit from them. Uh, but, the, but the innovations were there and the innovations for everyone to use. But right now, there's an attempt to create intellectual property rights over almost everything to the point where knowledge uh, is becoming uh, a, a, a commodity which can be bought and sold and traded on the market. Now, imagine a situation in which every time you refer to, say, Newton's theory of, uh, of gravitation, you had to pay uh, a license fee to, I don't know, the Newton Foundation. Uh, I mean, this is a crazy kind of situation that, that, that the U.S. is pushing right now, which is trying to protect its hegemony by preventing uh, the free flow of knowledge and the free flow of understandings. And given what the, 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 the nature of the attractions which exist, we find that it's not only knowledge, but also the people who have the knowledge who are being caught up in this. Right now, if you look at the United States, uh, where did NASA get all of its scientists from? Well, it took all of the German rocket scientists after World War II. 
What happened with the collapse of the Soviet Union? Well, collapse of the Soviet Union, all of those very sophisticated mathematicians and understandings migrated to the United States, and uh, so that uh, they've they've now come here. Uh, the United States has been sort of importing sophisticated uh, software engineers from India. In other words, in other words, and even a country like Britain, which has a, a pretty good uh, university structure. When, when people become very, very, very much involved in these technological innovations, they find themselves uh, lured to Silicon Valley or somewhere like that so that actually we have what we call brain drains, if you like, where, where the world's uh, intelligence is being increasingly uh, put into, into, one, uh, into one part of uh, the world. And the U.S. has been uh, 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 the lead of doing that and has done a very, I think, a very pretty good job of it. The one place where, where it has been done also very fast is, of course, China. And China has certain advantages uh, of this. First off, you have a huge market in China. And that huge market can allow artificial intelligence and uh, many of the other techniques which are being used to be tested out uh, in ways which is very difficult to do elsewhere. Secondly, the regulatory regime in China uh, is less uh, concerned about individual rights and all the rest of it, though we have seen, I think, uh, in uh, recent times how easy it's been really for capital uh, uh, and and uh, politically, if you like, as well, uh, to to avert uh, you know privacy laws almost entirely and get a tremendous amount of knowledge about what everybody is doing uh, from their credit card use and you know these smart data kind of uh, operations are, are all around us. So we have this 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 uh, situation where technology transfer is going to be, it seems to me, a big issue over the next few years. And how it works out is going to have, I think, an incredibly important role to play in economic development and, and the nature of the capitalist beast. Because to the degree that the United States succeeds in, in if you like, suppressing uh, and repressing uh, technological capacities in other parts of the world, you're likely to see a monopolization of that knowledge, and the monopolization of that knowledge is not uh, going to allow for free forms of, of growth. And what we're now headed into is uh, a technological impasse where the technological Im innovations are there and they're being made, but they cannot be applied because... Uh, freely applied because of, there is this barrier which is being set up to technological uh, and the application of technological innovation by uh, this system of intellectual property rights which the United States is trying to insist upon. My own view of this is that technology should be open. It should be uh, uh, open to, to, to all and and we should do as much as we can to try to equalize technological capacities and powers uh, throughout the world. And there's one interesting case of this, which I, I think I, 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 is useful to, to, to look at. I mentioned earlier that what we're seeing in the world is the growth of metropolitan areas, which are very sophisticated technologically, very sophisticated in terms of their educational structures and their, their talents and all the rest of it, and that increasingly we're seeing uh, economic development concentrated in, in the metropoles around the world, like uh, it'll be Shanghai or it'll be uh, Vancouver or it'll be where you know Melbourne or wherever. Uh, so we're seeing this, this, this concentration of metropolitan areas. And the result of that is that many uh, second-tier cities and, and, and uh, rural areas are, being, uh, are becoming technological deserts. I mean, you, I think you would find this would be true in the United States. I mean, the technological capacities and powers uh, available to you in, in, say, central Ohio are radically different from those which uh, you have in, in San Francisco. So one of the ways in which we should start to think about this is a, is a policy push to try to make uh, technologies available uh, to these uh, remote and rather more impoverished rural regions to get past 
what, what I mentioned last time, which is the Mardal principle of circular and cumulative co causation in which rich, rich regions get rich and poor regions uh, get, get, left, get left behind. Now, this uh, uh, situation... Uh, is one that uh, I think we're we're going to to see uh, attacked uh, in China itself. Now, President Xi, uh, I was surprised to find this. Apparently, during the Cultural Revolution, he lived in one of the poorest uh, villages in the whole of China, uh, and uh, he was there for six or seven years from 16 years on outward. So he's very well aware of the conditions of rural poverty in China, which are, which are pretty horrendous. And recently he returned to that village and gave a speech there in which he basically said it was on his agenda that uh, rural poverty and disadvantage should be abolished within the next you know, two or three years. And to that end, he proposed that all graduating uh, members of the party should go to these poor areas to try to teach the adequate technologies. Now, when this happened, people kind of wondered whether this was a sort of a return to the Mao principle that you send uh, students and the people to the countryside uh, in order to learn the wisdom of the peasantry. But no, this is the other way around. This is taking the technologies of the metropolitan areas and trying to uh, instantiate them in these rural areas so that people can, with the, the technological advantages, can, can begin to build an alternative economy which is going to actually bring themselves out of poverty. So it's not about some donating something. It's about trying to pull people out of, um, by giving people the, the instruments by which they can actually themselves uh, come out of poverty by, again, by uh, developing a technological base uh, for uh, laggard regions and, 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 and poorer regions. Now, this, again, seems to me to be a very important idea. And to the degree that is being implemented in China, I think we should watch very carefully to see what happens. Because if you look at the state of those economies which uh, have, in a way, been plundered and left desolate by capital, and the two examples I would look at would be, say, Greece and Puerto Rico, what you would find is that talented people in those economies have nowhere to go, so they move out. So the talented people of Greece, of you know, after the crisis uh, started after 2011 and so, have migrated out all over Europe. Uh, and talented people from Puerto Rico have also migrated out. And what we should be thinking about is, okay, how to actually take areas like Greece and Puerto Rico, and instead of sort of pretending they're just sort of uh, you know any old economies, they're 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 low productivity. They therefore, to the degree that they're producing any value, are finding that value being extracted to the metropolitan areas elsewhere. You can't support them by financial aid because if you give financial aid to poor regions, typically what happens is the poor regions spend the financial aid on goods and services which are coming from the metropole. So in fact, donating <laughs> something to the the poorer areas actually ends up back back in the pockets of of of, of the rich of the rich region so you know financial aid never works but what would work would be a a a, a program in which you you really try to sort of uh, flatten out uh, the technological disparities which underpin the distinction between capital intensive and labor intensive or high productivity versus low productivity economies so this is it seems to me to be the the main uh, uh, problem which we 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 need to look at in in in, in the very near future in addition to that, of course, there is the general issue of what is going to happen to the global capitalist economy. Uh, there are all kinds of stresses and strains evident. Uh, it is very, very strange that uh, interest rates are being pushed down at a moment when, when actually, theoretically, you would think they should be going in the other direction. So there are many issues, I think, in the capitalist economy, but uh, I don't have time to go into all of those here, so uh, they will 
crop up uh, in, in later discussions. But right now, I think it's very important to look at this whole kind of question of labor intensity and capital intensity as two forms of the economy. Think about uh, the way in which uh, they are being deployed right now and think about the question of technology transfer because the technological mix is a crucial uh, piece of the story as to what differentiates capital intensive from labor intensive economies and what's happening with that on the global stage is very much a contested area right now. So when we see Huawei being suppressed by and sanctions being put and all those kinds of things by the US, uh, the US fighting with China over intellectual property rights with a fearsome way, I think that what, what you have to understand is what lies behind it is that advantage which flows uh, to the United States from maintaining itself as the capital intensive economy and not allowing other economies to become uh, a parallel uh, uh, parallel intensity with it. Uh, it did allow that to happen for geopolitical reasons with Japan and, and South Korea and Taiwan, uh, but uh, it's not allowing it anymore and it's hanging on to its privileges uh, by this whole kind of uh, corralling of intellectual property rights, which seems to me to be about enclosing the global commons of uh, the knowledge structures that humanity has available to it and turning that into commodities uh, which are controlled uh, by, by, uh, basically by, by the US. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.